Hey there, everybody. Um, it's a Sunday morning. It's a rainy, cloudy Sunday morning in November, which are honestly one of, one of my favorite things. I really like. I really like uh, autumn, even late autumn when everything starts getting kind of gray and gross. Um, I just find it really relaxing. And this week has been so busy that I'm kind of happy to have a Sunday morning just to you know, do things like this. Because of course now we're heading into the holiday season. Thanksgiving is this week and boy, it it feels like the next couple months, um, December, January, um, even into February are going to be kind of crazy months for me. Um, so we good, but good stuff for the most part. Um, I just, I just ordered another deck of cards. I promised myself I wouldn't do... Actually, that's a lie. I bought two decks. I I bought... Um, This is not what this video is about, but um, I got a request for a video about Lenormand, and I don't know how I feel about Lenormand, but I bought this. This is the Maybe Lenormand. So I'm going to play with it. I don't... I'm not drawn to fortune-telling um, as a thing. And that's what Lenormand seems to be about, but... So I bought that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna experiment with a little bit and see what I think. Um, Kelly from the Truth and Story has a really good approach, so I'm gonna try to absorb as much as I can from her videos and her handouts. Um, and then I bought the Tower of the Trees this morning because why not? <laughs> Spending money on stuff. Um, so, but what we're gonna talk about today is the suit of wands. And in many ways, this is my favorite suit. And I'm breaking my own rule here um, because this is my favorite suit in a lot of ways, but it's also the one where artistically a lot of decks, I feel like, kind of fail me. Um, they, for, for a fire-based suit, they often leave me cold. And I don't know why. I think it's just because my standards are so high. But I've added two decks to the mix here. Um, which I probably won't do for any of the other suits, but maybe for some of the majors. I'm not sure, but, um, I've added the Prisma Visions and the Raven's Prophecy to my four, um, common ones that I've been using, the, uh, Universal Wade Smith, the Wild Unknown, the Fountain, and the Alice. Um, I do think it's because my standards are so high. I, and it's because my, um... My life uh, is is so um, driven by creativity. You know, creative work is so important to me, and that's an element of this suit. Maybe it's also because I'm a fire sign, so I'm, I'm a Leo, so there's that in there. But I also think it depicts a really interesting journey of 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 um, creation. You know, this is a fire. You know, the fire can be such a destructive force, but in the tarot, to me, it's such a creative force. It's such a um, force for um, making. So I think that's interesting to me. Um, and uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna have six decks instead of four for this suit, and who knows? Um, breaking my own rule. <laughs> Whatever. I get to, right? Um, part of the reason why I included these two is because artistically, both of these decks really feel energetically, um, more fiery than, say, the Waite Smith does. Um, and even the, um, uh, Fountain Tower, which I love, um, there's energy in the suit, but it just, there's like, there's like a, um, quality in these couple, these two decks um, that I included because they they really do feel the decks themselves kind of feel fiery. Um, the Raven's Prophecy Tarot is very fiery. In fact, fire is a huge element in the cards. Um, you're you're gonna see all these anyway. But um, no, you know one of the things about reading and and learning to read and collecting is that you very quickly realize that there's no perfect deck, and which is like life. So you kind of you know, kind of finding decks that you're attracted to or people or jobs or whatever that you're attracted to is a matter of settling for something, you know? It is. It's like, what am I willing to settle for? Um, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, let's get into the, the suits. 
So um, for me, as I said, um, the suit of wands is a very fiery one. Uh, when I think of the suit of wands, I already talked about creativity and sort of the act of making, the act of creation. It's also for me about vocation. And I use that word a lot if you've been watching my videos recently. Whenever wands come up, I talk about vocation. And that may be kind of a, a, a weird term. It, there's a religious aspect to it. Because when, for example, um, if you grew up like I did in the Catholic Church, there's, you know, one, one's vocation might be to become a priest or a nun. I think of vocation more broadly as the work that we're meant to do. So this is... This is this is our, our our life's work in a way when we're looking at the wands. I also think about um, work work more broadly, but the pentacles is the next suit I'm going to do, and with pentacles you get work as well. But where where pentacles are your job, wands are your career. You know, pentacles are what you do to make ends meet. Wands are what fulfills your 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 spiritual cup you know what i mean it's um it's a fun and they work together really well i used to do a lot with elemental dignities and this idea that there were elements that were um opposed to one another like fire and water and fire and earth to a degree because uh cups and pentacles or water and earth are more receptive um they they but heads with the fire with the wands. I think about that less and less. In fact, I was laying in bed this morning thinking about doing this video and I was thinking about how in addition to creativity and and vocation and making wands can be very much about relationships too and I used to read them as as sort of the antithesis of relationships. But I think that um I think that as I've evolved, they're not, you know what I mean? It's just, they're the volatile part of relationships. They're the assertive part of relationships. They're, um, they're aggressive sexuality rather than receptive sexuality, do you know? So there is an opposition in a way to the suit of cups, but it's not necessarily a negative one. Um, I talk about this a lot, but you know, fire can evaporate water, and water can put out fire, so there is opposition there. But they can also work together to create steam and move engines, you know. So there, there's an element of the, the combining of those two elements um, is volatile, but it's not necessarily, um, uh, one doesn't necessarily negate the other. So I think that's interesting. So, because I think there is sex in the suit of wands as much as there is in the suit of cups and as we get into sort of gender archetypes which i really hate i just really do i know that we're not supposed to think of them that way it just bugs me but um it it does make sense if we think outside of the gendered quality of it um there are people who have a more aggressive quality to them and there are people who have a more receptive quality to them and so you do get that yin and yang quality. There's that lingam and yani quality. Um, I wish we didn't have the male and female. I get why we have that. I just, it just, especially now with the way the world is, it bugs me, but whatever. That's not the point. The point is that, um, I don't necessarily believe what I used to believe that wands are a bad sign for relationships. I think they are a sign of volatility in relationships. I think they're a sign of, um, pursuing, a sign of going for, um, there's an active pushing, there's an aggression, um, rather than a receptive. So one of the things I think I'm going to explore in a future video is how each suit works with relate with questions that focus on another suit. So how wands, swords, and pentacles uh, uh, deal with relationships, how cups work with work, you know what I mean? So anyway, so wands in that way do have relationship because there's passion and force in them. Um, but by and large, I do think about these as acts of creation, as fire, as vocation, as the, the, our life's work, our life's goals. And with the ace, what we get is an ignition point, really. 
very much more than any of the other aces because we have the suit of fire. It's like striking a match, which is one reason why I really love Ellis and Wild Unknown. I did that backwards. Ellis and Wild Unknown. Um, the Fountain Tower to a degree too. There is this this feeling of ignition um, of striking a match. So it is it is in that way um, the beginning of a project, the beginning of a pursuit of something. Um, a new vocation or a new endeavor, a new project, uh, a new passion. So something that has suddenly erupted for you. You know, this may be um, tarot, for example, if you're coming to this as someone who's just starting out. You you may be in a very ace of wands moment with tarot, and there's this huge amount of passion. Um, and there's all this fuel to burn. And that's the other thing with the suit of wands that I think is really interesting, too, is that... Um, it can burn out quickly if we're not careful because fuel is limited in almost every situation. Um, and as we get to the end of the suit, breaking my own rule again here, um, I'm not going quite in our, I'll come back to this, but when you get to the 10, for example, um, there's, there's a sense of carrying more fuel to the fire. You know, you have to sustain the energy to keep anything going. Um, and, Never really thought about it before this moment, honestly, um, before I started talking about it that way, which is one reason why I like doing these videos, too. Um, I feel like there's other things about the 10 that I'll talk about when we get there, but um, the the suit of wands does require sustainability. You know, you can't burn through a whole forest of wood. It doesn't grow back fast enough. You know, so you, you need to moderate your energy. And that's one of the struggles with the suit of wands is the ability to moderate energy. Where water and air, which are the two we've talked about, cups and swords, the mind and the emotions seem to be limitless. Fire sort of isn't. Creativity isn't. Energy isn't. You need to sustain it. And so one of the, the negative points of the Ace of, of, of Wands here is that if you're not careful, it can burn out really quickly. And anyone who's done creative work or work that they're really passionate about, it, passionate about may have experienced burnout as a result of having given so much to a project. You know, you give everything to it, and that's, that, you know, it's great. You give 110%, right? But then what's left for you? Um... And that's one reason why the tarot is interesting, too, because you need the other suits to balance this energy out, you know. Um, left to its own devices, the suit of wands will burn itself out. So you need you need air, to because fire needs oxygen. Um, you need water to temper it, and you need earth to ground it. So fire, um, to be its most productive, really needs the other suits uh, in, in a way that maybe the, uh, I think all suits are interdependent, but I think fire needs the other three to moderate itself in a way that the other three may not be quite as dependent, you know, air and water and earth can in their way, take care of themselves a little, a little bit more than fire can. Fire is needy. Um, and one of the things it needs is to be reined in. Otherwise it will destroy. Otherwise it will get destructive. And so with the ace of wands in that way, uh, its negative can be burning out way too fast, burning too hot too quickly. Um, you get a sense with this in relationships too, you know, and here's where the suit of wands affects relationships and aces may reflect, affect relationships in a negative way or a positive way. You know, the initial attraction, the initial um, lust for or interest in um, comes out of the ace of wands. But unless that temperature is moderated, you, you get those relationships that are really hot for a really short amount of time and then bleh, they burn, you know, they're done. Um, which sometimes is, sometimes is fine. Um, and sometimes is fun, but you, you know, you need to moderate that if you want to sustain it. With the Ace of Wands in reverse, you could also have a lack of fire there or not even reverse. And it's negative because I'm not using reverses, like I said, as much as I used to. But another negative implication of the Ace of Wands can be kind of a lack of fuel for a fire or a lack of fire. The spark just isn't starting, you know, or it's delay. It's taking a long time to ignite. Uh, there's a lack of passion or a lack of willpower involved. Um, it could be an opportunity you decline. Um, it could be an opportunity that gets derailed. So with the ace, we get that. I don't actually like the ace in the um, 
Raven's Prophecy, because it is so heavily burning, uh, it does sort of um, speak to the uh, the the more negative sign of the Ace. Although this deck is some of the most beautiful art. I haven't really used it much. I'm just including it here because energy wise it it is hotter um in many ways than the other decks which i which i miss with these other decks which are beautiful all right so that's that's the ace um so we move on to the two and i just started reading on coco c's recommendation i think um the um uh Kabbalistic Tarot book by Robert Wang. And because of that, the esoteric titles have been on my mind. And this is an interesting card. I always sort of remember this as um, Lord of Dominion. I think it's Lord of Dominion. You get that sense with this card. Um, so with the Two of Wands, um, this traditionally to me is sort of the first step of the journey, the first step of the project. It's the planning phase. It's the considering phase. It's the, um, mapping out the outlining, the, um, even as simple as putting the address into the GPS, the brainstorming stage, the point where you're really generating the, the process, you know, process planning, that sort of thing. Um, it can be the corralling of resources, you know, so pulling together what you need. It can be the plotting of a journey, like I said, the first step of that journey. Choosing a path and following it, there's definitely a, a, a path-finding aspect to this. It can be the consideration of something turning into action on something. So with the Two of Swords, for example, we have the sort of meditative act of thinking about something, the Two of Wands takes that thinking and puts it into action. So you get that element. I really like the um, Wild Unknown, too, because there's almost a sense of divining, um, like a divining rod, you know? So it, it's, like a, it's like a very um, primitive compass, in a way, of figuring out where to go. The Two of Wands in the Fountain Tarot, I really struggled with for a while, um, because they they define this much differently than I do. Um, do I have the book here? Of course I should have had it out. Um, it was actually one of the reasons why I didn't initially respond to the deck, because I just, you know, as, as all artists do, um, they absolutely make up their own meanings for things and I think ah uh, two choices I don't necessarily view the card as two choices um and what you get here is a sense of um tension in the card for me like it doesn't the the card doesn't even really match their meaning to me because it's um there's a there's a balancing act here that I don't necessarily associate with the two of wands um but it does make sense to me because those initial steps are difficult and they require a level of concentration and dedication that, you know, again, won't it, it won't sustain the project or thing, the relationship, whatever. It won't sustain without a certain amount of dedication to a difficult act. So, though I don't necessarily view this as a choice, um, I think the act of trying to kind of hold all these pieces in this way to sustain a project or to, to get the project going is an interesting one. Now, the negative impulse of the Two of Rods or Two of Wands is um, really kind of pussyfooting around and, and like, I'll get around. It's procrastination. I'll get around to it. Because the early stages of a project aren't necessarily the sexiest. I don't know who this writer was, and I wish I could remember who said these quotes that I like. But, you know, there's a very famous writer who said, I don't like writing, I like having written. You know, the starting out of a project frequently feels like, oh, you know, it's going to be so long before I get to the end result. So the Two of Wands and its negative implication is that oh, I'll, get, I'll get to it later. You know, it's facing the blank page and not being able to type or facing the blank canvas and not being able to paint, not being able to ask that person out. You know, I'll, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And one of the dangers of doing that is you may miss out. There's a um, 
Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, who has a new book out on creativity called Big Magic. And I like it. There's some things that she she says that I kind of disagree with, but I, I like the book by, by and large. And she talks about the idea of ideas um, as kind of living beings, and they sort of might float in and latch on to you. And they're like, hey, work with me. Write this, paint this, compose this, start this. Uh, I think we might be a good match. Um, but you may not be a good match or you may not be ready or whatever. And eventually, if you don't get to it, the idea may detach itself from you and move on to someone else who's going to bring it to life. So I, I think there's that energy in this card, too. Um, you know, if you don't if you don't act on it, the idea may move on to someone else. You know, and I think that's something that happens to people. You know, oh, I had that idea years ago. Why didn't I ever do that? Um, there's an element to the Two of Wands and its negative um, functions that involves refusing to choose a path or set a course. Um, there's indecision. So in that sense, we do get a, um, a choice-based thing, as the Fountain Tarot says, uh, indecision, inability to kind of figure out what the first step is. Or decision, uh, disinterest in a project. You know, just because a project arrives doesn't mean you want to do it or that you have any interest in it. And maybe it's like a good, you know, a good thing in theory, but it may not be something that you're interested in. Um, so the question becomes then, do I do this thing that might be good for me or do I wait for something better to come along? One of the things that I remember about the Three of Wands when I started reading, especially because I was using exclusively the Waitsmith deck then, was how much it felt like the two. You know, they really just feel like the same card with an additional wand and a costume change. You know, so <laughs> I always thought that was interesting. Um, but with the Three of Wands, what's interesting to me and one of the reasons why I pulled out these three decks is that in these three versions, you get a very interesting thing that you don't necessarily see. In a, you kind of see it in the, the Fountain Tarot a little bit. There's a triangulation. You definitely see it in the Wild Unknown. Um, if you look closely at the Prisma Visions, you, you see it. Can you see it? Yes. There's a triangulation there. You definitely see it in the... Um, in the Raven's Prophecy. So there's um, th there's something interesting to me in the evolution of the Three of Wands for modern artists where there's this sense of, uh, it just feels like the the coming together of the three creates um, creates an energy of possibility. There's like a, and there's like a scrying element to this too, which is really, really interesting to me. It's not necessarily informed how I've, I read this card yet, but, um, I'm I'm really interested in in these th and I love that there's three of them. These three decks have this triangulation in a way that other decks don't, and you don't necessarily see in the other threes in in these same decks. So I'm really really curious about why the, the fire and the three creates this kind of vortex in these cards. I think is really interesting. It's like a portal that you can pass through. It's like going through the looking glass in a weird way. So it's really, really, really interesting to me. And um, I don't know, I get kind of excited when I see things like that because I assume these artists didn't get together to talk about it. They're all relatively new decks. One may have been influenced by the others or, you know, one may have influenced the others, but um, I don't know, it's, it's I, haven't, I haven't settled on what that says yet, but the fact that there's this little mini trend here is really exciting to me. Um... I do have a fairly traditional interpretation of the Three of Wands, which is, is firmly based on Waits and Smith's interpretation and Smith's drawing of this idea of setting sail, of sort of setting the, the ship. Maybe the, I, I, we, the book is in the other room, so I'm not going to go grab it. I wish I could go look at the esoteric titles for these two. But um, you're, you're essentially, you know, in the two, you've set a path. In the three, you're you're sending the energy out into the world. So in the two, you decided what the first steps would be. You planned the project, you planned the first steps. In the three, you're really taking those first steps. Um, there's an element of delegation to the three of wands, which I think is interesting because, you know, in Smith's picture, he's not on the ship, he's watching the ships go out. Um, so you do, it, there is an advice here of delegating. 
there's an element of watching things take flight, of, of pushing things into the world. On a very practical level, this can mean shipping or submissions. So if you work in a creative environment, you whether you're an artist or a writer, um, I don't know what it's like in all arts, but what you could get here is, you know, sending out submissions to Lit Mag's agents, um, going on auditions, going for job interviews, going for um, um, look-sees, you know, like they talk about on America's Next Top Model, is that what they call them? Um, showing off your portfolio, uh, sending out query letters, uh, there's a concept my therapist told me about when I was thinking about looking for a new job called reverse interviewing, where you go out to organizations and you express interest in them um, and say, hey, I'm, you know, this is something I'm interested in doing. Can we talk? Uh, so so it's sort of an, an energy of, of extending outward, of releasing, of pushing, um, of potential beginning to actualize. Do you know what I mean? So you, you get the beginning, the early steps, the early days of a project, but you also get the initiative, putting the initiative out. I think there's that's an interesting sense with this with this card. I think that again, the negative implication of that is extending it too much. You know, um I used to be an actor. That's how I really started in the creative world. And I hated people who would go into auditions and and they were like bad politicians you know it just used to draw in fact now that I'm a writer um and I've been watching auditions for my plays over the years I, I it kind of turns me off when actors sell themselves too much when it's just too thick you know what I mean so you get you may get a sense of overselling yourself here overselling a project overdoing this so you're sub you're submitting or sending out too many resumes you're making yourself too available which you can do you know it um in companies for example where a lot of hiring is done internally if you apply for every job that comes out you're less and less likely to get a new job or promotion because what people start to assume is that you're not interested in a specific job you're just interested in in the title or just making more money you know what i mean and so with this card you get that sense of like overdoing it um similar to the two you can also have a sense of standing back and not joining in the event so um you know you you your involvement may be necessary uh but you're just sort of too, you're too interested in delegating it's like okay you do that and i'll just watch you know and that doesn't make for progress it doesn't make for good collaboration either um you know partnered with the three of pentacles which we'll look at in another video this could be really positive or this could suggest someone in the collaboration is standing out of the project and thinks well my job you know i'm just i'm managing this i'm the project manager so i don't actually have to do the work you know so there's that's the danger in the three when you especially when you compare it to the three of pentacles which we'll look at later on um being passive um this could also indicate being a silent partner for for good or bad so very interested in this triangulation here with the threes. I'm really curious about that. Who knows what that'll yield, but I'm interested in exploring it. The four is a card that always interests me too. Because it doesn't seem to fit in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, a lot of books that I read early on had, had this sort of like suggestion of a wedding celebration. Um... But what I have come to see this card as is, um, is, is like the celebration of the early phase. Like, okay, we got through phase one. We got through the pilot phase. We got through the early days. We got, we got a first draft done. Um, we got a sketch out, you know, uh, maybe we've interested an agent in our work. Maybe we've got a second interview. Maybe we've got, um, someone to return our phone call, you know, someone we're interested in. So, you know, with the four of wands, there's like the, the celebration of the early part. It's, it's sort of like the mini celebration. It's the, Hey, yay, you know, they're there. I got a center, second interview or, you know, they're going to read my script or, you know, my friend is going to give this to, you know, um, uh, Pink's producer. I don't know why I chose, love Pink. I don't know why I chose her particular, you know what I mean? But like, whatever the case is, oh, they're willing to look at my portfolio for that gallery show. Uh, they're willing to look at my proposal for this new project at work. You know, so it's like that moment of like, 
yay, we put the work out there and it's starting to yield results. Um, so it, it's, it's like a, it's like a good, it's celebrating the, the, the first step. Um, and I tell my writing students, cause I teach writing workshops, you know, that like submitting your work is hard. Putting your work out there and making yourself vulnerable is difficult because, um, you, you're gonna, you're gonna get rejected. You know, it's, it's, you know, no, no writer or no creative person, no musician, no, um, CEO for that matter, got that the first time, unless they happen to be, you know, related to the, the, the comp, you know, the company, unless they're a company man, you know what I mean? Unless they're like the son of the former CEO or the daughter of the producer, or, you know, whatever it is, most of us are going to face rejections like that. So, um, celebrating the act of putting yourself out there is important. And I think the four of wands embodies that in a lot of ways. I think the four of wands, um, is a little win. You know what I mean? I love this idea of a little win. Um, I talked about earlier, I don't know a whole lot about Lenormand, but like I know the clover, as Kelly from The Truth and Story calls it, little luck. So you, I think there's like a little win here. There's like a, a gentle cause for celebration. We did, we got through that first phase and good for us. Um, uh, there could be, there, there is a party aspect to this. Um, and so this could also be needing to be in a community of creative people or like-minded people, um, being in an artist's colony, being at a networking event, being at a conference, do you know? So there's the kind of communal joy that comes out of being around people who are interested in the same things you are or who do the same things you do and can teach you. And you, so you network and you, and you meet others that way. Um, it could just be a party too, you know, let's be honest. It could be going to a party, a fair, something like that. Um, you know, if, if this were a reading and someone were asking, how do I fundraise for this project I want to do? I, this might say, let's, you know, do a, a fair of some kind, do a party of some kind, do a benefit, you know what I mean? A social event of some kind. So I think that there's like a practical aspect to this too. Um, the, the negative implications of this could be spending too much time on the, like, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to raise money for this company, you know, for your, for your startup. And you're so engaged in like the social aspect of it that you're not actually putting in the work that needs to get done. So it's, it's, it's all about the fundraising and the networking and the glamour and the, you know, part of the soirees and the, who do you know, and who, who have you met? And, but you're not doing anything that's yielding any results. So the focus becomes too much on that. The focus could also involve kind of a delayed gratification or a feeling of depression um in rejection so you so you get that not getting the senate second interview not joining in the event being scared of networking being scared of going to the conference being nervous of going to the conference social anxiety can be part of this um so you, you get that or you know it could also be it just wasn't a very good time so you know if this comes up for a relationship reading you know if you had a date it was sort of meh you know, maybe not awful, but just sort of like, eh, you know, there wasn't a lot of spark. There wasn't a lot of passion. So that's the four. Um, yeah. The Wild Unknown is so interesting. One of the reasons why I initially didn't want to buy this deck was because of so many of the cards in the Wild Unknown, especially in this suit. They are so, they are so Pip-like. And I thought that that would make it really hard to read. It's similar in the Suit of Pentacles, too, which you'll see if you have... I'm, everyone has seen this deck, so I'm sure you've seen it. But I felt like I wasn't going to be able to read it. But actually, that's not true. Um, and I'm, I'm getting more and more interested in decks that aren't necessarily pips, like playing card pips, but that have an energy in... But I'm not... I find myself... Uh, less distracted by what's happening in the picture when I have these cards that have like, there's a celebratory energy. There's like a fiery explosion of energy. There's something great in here, but it doesn't have like, you know, a couple sort of people in fake Renaissance garb. If this remind you know what this reminds me of this card is the beginning of the Kenneth Branagh movie of much ado about nothing, which I, I love that movie, but I don't necessarily have, the experience of maidens um 
skipping through meadows, you know, with flowers in their hands in my life often. Uh, uh, you know, who doesn't have maidens skipping through meadows in their lives from time to time? But it doesn't really happen as much to me as it used to, you know, which is too bad. I think I think we could all... I think we could all use more maidens skipping through meadows in our lives. This is making, I'm just being sarcastic, obviously. It's making me think of Little Britain. Have you ever seen Little Britain and the character they do? I think it's Emily Brent. You know, I'm a lady. I love it. Anyway, totally off topic. I'm in a good mood. It's a rainy Sunday. What more could you ask for? Five of Wands. Oh. Um. So here we get into the first really um, negative sort of overall card in the the suit of wands from my impression um and it just you know i love tarot it's so silly i i'm sitting here now and thinking you know you're so often looking at the deck randomly and um you know you're just pulling out cards at random you don't necessarily see the cards in sequence but sometimes when you do you realize how much planning went into them um you know, into those early decks. And I know people love or hate the Waitsmith deck. And I'm reading the, the Robert Wang book about Kabbalah and Tarot. And he seems to really snub his nose at the Waitsmith deck. I mean, he's very snide about it in a lot of ways. Um, and there's there's a thing I've noticed, and maybe it's not true, but I've perceived that folks who have a more esoteric or um, arcane or uh, secret, you know, Golden Dawn approach... Uh, can be very snide about the Waitsmith deck, but thank God they, thank God, you know, because I, Pamela Coleman Smith knew what she was doing, because in any project, you're you're never working alone. Even if you're a novelist who's sitting alone and you're writing for years, a good novelist is eventually going to come up against an editor. Now, a lucky novelist is going to have a professional editor. Editor. Um, a brave and maybe unlucky novelist is going to be faced with an audience who serves as an editor. You know, editors are important. Um, directors are important to playwrights. Actors are important to playwrights. You know, um, uh, curators are important to artists. Conductors and musicians are important to composers. Bosses are important to employees. Um, we, but there, there comes a point in any project where conflict arises. You know, and after that, you know, it, it usually happens where, you know, yay, I get the set, you know, they approved the, they approved the, the proposal I, I put out or they, they accepted my play or, you know, they're going to, um, they're going to, they're going to put on a show of my work. And then comes the moment where we want you to cut this, this, and this. We don't like that scene. That photograph doesn't belong in this display. That chord sounds weird. This project, this part of the project is out of scope and out of budget. And then it's like, Fuck. You know what I mean? Like, that's when you want to start punching kittens. Obviously, obviously you're not going to do that. It's just an expression. Um, and I, I'm sitting here just sort of in awe of how, uh, you know, very, very well planned this was. You know what I mean? That, uh, that she had the wisdom to, to see this in the writing, uh, in the, in the drawings. So in the five of, of wands, we do get conflict. Conflict is good. Um, one of the things I do in my job, and one of the things I've been doing this week, is I lead a workshop in a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which is a corporate book, and it's about, you know, building healthy corporate teams. And one of the things in there is how important healthy conflict is. You air the conflicts, you trust one another to hear the conflicts and respond without taking it personally, you know, and you engage in that way. And through that, you come to a resolution, which you could look at as the six, um, so healthy conflict is good. So there is an element of healthy conflict to this. There's there's a little bit of a chaotic here, but there can be healthy conflict. Um, so, you know, con there's also negative conflict. There's also being defeated by conflict. And how you pass through conflict is going to determine the rest of the project. So, you know, if you, if you get the rejection or if they want rewrites, or they don't want that photograph, or they want you to change this part of your proposal, whatever the case is, you can either sulk, or you can do it, or you can find a way to meet in the middle. But you, you've got to go through the conflict. But this, you know, as, as the middle of the suit is the turning point. Um, you know, are you, are you going to do the rewrites? Are you going to engage on it? Or are you going to pout? You know, and maybe you're going to pout. And that's fine. 
Maybe you're not. Who knows? Maybe you are going to find a solution in the middle. So we get that. Now, this could also be sporting. You know what I mean? This could be athleticism. This could describe someone who's athletic. Um, you know, it could recommend um, playfulness. There's a playfulness. There's a wrestling, you know, sort of quality to this of sort of, you know, people wrestling with each other. Uh, sexually, you know, this could be sort of, you know, liking it rough, for example. Um, and then in the negative implications, we get unhealthy conflict or lack of conflict. You know, um, false harmony, which is something that they talk about in Five Dysfunctions of a Team, false harmony um, is bad because everyone's sort of like, yeah, yay. But inside they're resenting each other. So you get false harmony with this card. Um, it could be unsportsmanlike behavior or nastiness, or it could be cheating. Really cool. I don't know. I just, you know, sometimes looking at the cards in order this way and just sort of thinking through what they mean, um, it just tickles me. So, and then if we choose to move through the healthy conflict, um, there's a mini win there. There's a victory there. We go on to the next step. We move forward. Um, there's a verb-like quality to the six where it's like, okay, good. We've gotten through phase, you know, the first half. This is the second act. This is the beginning of the journey. You know, if you've ever seen a musical, you know, the second act starts with its big number. This is the big number. Um, you know, so it's a victory lap. It's not a victory, it's a victory lap in a way. You know, it's um it's it's getting the trophy, it's winning the award. There's a champion quality there. There's there's a sense of having a healthy ego. Um there's um coming through the 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 conflict, so coming through the fray. We did it, you know what I mean? We got through the conflict and we decided that there's gonna be a, a phase two for this project, or we're gonna take it out of pilot phase and put it into production, or you know, whatever the case is, you know, we got we got through it and we can celebrate that. So in a way it's an elevation of the four of wands. So where that was like a little win, this is a slightly bigger win, you know? Um it's and it's like the yay it's the rah rah quality of like we we got through that first half i'm saying the same thing over and over again i'm very emotional about this can you tell uh, <laughs> um but again i like the idea of a victory lap over a victory um you know this could be be you know in a competition it's like it's not the world series but it's the playoffs um, you could have here someone who's a sore winner and the negative aspects are someone who's bragging or boorish, someone who's a showboater, um, or someone who has a really exceptional amount of arrogance, um, which of course is super unattractive. Uh, you know, being a sore winner sucks. So, uh, there's, there's that element to it too. Uh, it could be failing. It could be a small failure. Um, there could be a cheating quality here too. Um, in terms of like using maybe unethical techniques to win. Um, so that's the six. And then because life is life, we go from that moment of yay to this moment of uh, which is you achieve a certain amount of anything. And there's a certain amount of having to fight to stay on top. You know, um, there's a there's a corporate theory called the Peter Principle, which is we rise to our level of incompetence. I haven't really seen that demonstrated in life. But, um, you know, once you reach a certain level, you, you have to raise the bar and you do have to fight to stay on top a little bit. And, you know, especially if it's a sporting event, say, you know, you, you, you made it to the playoffs, but you can't rest now. You know what I mean? There's still the the, you know, the series to play. So you, 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 the, the, you know, the six was a, a breath of yay. The seven is like, all right, let's get back to work. Let's keep working through this project. Um, you know, so there's more work to do and there is an element of fighting to stay on top. I really love the seven in the wild unknown because there, it kind of takes us back to the ace in a way. There's like the striking of the match and the lighting of the candles again. All right. So we've come through this far. Now it's kind of like, let's go back to what brought, what's like, get. <laughs> <laughs> let's get back to what we initially thought. Like, what were our initial impulses? And let's explore that again um, as we sort of fight into the next phase. I love the um, Raven's Prophecy 7, where you get the, um, the, the, you know, protecting of the candles, I think is really cool. You know, but you're burning yourself at the same time. Um, the Prism of Visions is interesting because you're sort of jumping from pole to pole and you could easily fall. The Fountain Tarot um, is very simple, but I, I like this one too. Um, you're just you're you're just back in in combat mode in a way. Um, uh, 
you know, uh, thinking of a theatrical metaphor for anyone who knows anything about theater, when you are doing a show, you have a preview period and it's, it's great because you, you know, awesome, you know, audiences are seeing it, but then frequently you have to go back to the drawing board in a lot of ways. So there's that sense in the seven, like, okay, great. You know, we've got the audience in and like, ugh, no, act two doesn't work. So let's go, let's go fight our way through that slog again, for example. Um, so, you know, there's that energy in the seven. Um, keeping your place once you've achieved a certain, uh, a certain level of success, you know, cause I mean, the reality is sometimes you reach a certain level of success and now people are coming for you. Um, you know, so you can be fending off energies, uh, or enemies, fending off conflict. You could be fighting conflict in this case to stay on top. You may be experiencing conflict you don't want to deal with. Um, you could be fending off distractions too. So there's that, you know, the outside world way, world may want to encroach and you're like, nope, I need to focus on this project. Sorry guys, get out. I'm going to fight you off. Um, there, and then negative, negative, gosh negatively um, this could indicate losing your grip or running from conflict or battling imaginary foes or like throwing in the towel the eight is probably one of the most iconic images in tarot i really love the eight of wands this is one of my favorite eight of wands in in the fountain tarot I also really like the Wild Unknown here. Um, I, honestly, there, I feel like there isn't a whole lot to dwell on with this card. There is that sense of pushing forward, of directing work into the world. Again, we come back to the idea of resumes and submissions, of applying for jobs. We got through the first round. Maybe we didn't get what we wanted. Maybe in the seven, we failed. You know, maybe in the seven, the, the script got rejected or the, the show got turned down or the proposal didn't go into production, you know. Um, so now with the ace, we go uh, with the eight, we go right back in and we start pushing our energy back out. But there's also that final push up the mountain too. You know what I mean? You reach a certain point with a project or with a relationship or with anything, and you've really got to like push the energy forward to get it over the hump. And so with the eight of wands, you get that, um, you know, it's really just the willpower to move forward. You know, you, you're the little engine that could here. Um, and you're, you're just you know, full steam ahead is, is really the eight. And then again, the negative of that is maybe being full steam ahead before it's ready or not pushing with as much energy as you need to in order to get the workout. So um, in the eight, you, you get that. It also could indicate a lack of direction or a lack of progress. So you don't know where to go or your energy is diffuse um, or you're just not making the progress you want to be or you're not at the place in the project where you want to be. Um, uh, it could be avoiding work. Again, we come back to this idea of procrastination. Um, so that's the eight. One of the simplest cards in the deck to interpret, I think, because there's very little to say about it. But um, in context, I think it often paints an interesting picture. The nine is curious. So with the nine and the ten of wands, this is where people sort of like, oh, the wands is such a depressing suit. It's not. It's just that anything worth doing costs and in the 9 and 10, we really see that, you know what I mean? In the 9 and 10 of Wands, you're tired. You've been working hard. You're spent. You know, anything that's worth doing is going to take energy away from you. And and so the negative aspect of the 9 and 10 in particular is not having sustained your energy. You know, as I talked about in the Ace, like the, the Wands can burn out too fast if you don't have the other elements to sustain them and ground them and temper them you know um so the the negative aspects of the nine and ten are are that like you just don't have the energy left to get where you need to go because you spent it all in the early phases you know anyone who's run a marathon will tell you you need to sustain you need to measure out your energy you can't just you can't run at the same speed for the whole length of a marathon you will collapse and so in the nine we, we get a sense of that in its negative element. In its negative aspect, we've, we, we haven't conserved our energy and we still have you know another leg of the marathon to go and we are out of breath and out of energy and out of hydration um, and there's that. So that's, like, that's the negative aspect um, in a way. But then the, the converse of that is 
you're sustaining the energy and you have it left to make the final push and you know that there's a few more steps and yes, you've been through hell to get here, but you're gonna keep going because it's that important. Maybe you're a little defensive. Maybe you're a little bit um, um, gun shy now. Maybe you're not quite as optimistic as you were at the start, but this has been important and you're pushing through and you've got it and you're going to fight off anyone or anything that gets in your way. That's the nine of wands to me. You know, you are not, you're going to climb that hill. You're going to, you know, forge every stream, um, follow every rainbow until you find your dream. Yeah, I said it. But you know what I mean? Like, you, it's, it's, uh, you're gonna get there. You're just so close. It's also like that, you know, on a long road trip, it's like the last hour of the trip where you're like, oh my God, if I don't get out of this car right now, I'm gonna like bash my brains against the window. Um, but you're gonna get there, you know? You can't stop now, so you keep going. Um, there's also an element here too of, of um, feeling the weight of a success, you know, so success always feels attractive until you reach there and then there's a lot to manage when you succeed at something. Um, battle bruised, um, as I talked about this, anything worth doing has a real cost. Um, how much, work, you know, sort of looking back and realizing, God, that's a lot of work, you know, and, and in the weight deck, the Smith deck, we do get a sense of kind of looking backwards at the previous cards and you're sort of like, oh my God, look how far I've come, like I'm exhausted. Um, so it, the cost of doing business, I wrote here the art of war, which I think is interesting. Um, you know, and then again, there can be negative aspects. So it can be being gun shy, being abused by work, being let down, having, you know, gotten as far as, you know, I got four interviews for this job and there's one more, or I got four interviews for this job and they're not giving it to me. You know, I went through all of that and they're not giving it to me. So you do have that there. Um being ignored there could be bad reviews or an interview that goes badly um bad meetings or projects that have just gone off the rails um misplaced efforts um and then in collaboration defensiveness um or feeling defenseless in a collaboration so that happens too sometimes when you're when you're in a relationship of peers or what or a project or even in a relationship with others where you suddenly feel attacked or defenseless or defensive, like your actions need to be defended. So there is that quality there too. And then we get into the 10, which is traditionally associated with burden. But again, I, this is just like this thing to me of anything worth doing costs. Anything worth doing involves spending energy on. And I feel like um, no card really that I've ever seen kind of does this. Maybe the... Um, the Raven's Prophecy with this, um, with this, uh, animal, with the elk, um, you know what I mean? But it, it, it just, you know, it's, it's really, it's really not easy, um, to see what I mean in, in this card. You get a little bit of it in the Prism of Visions, too. Um, ooh, my battery is dying. I hope I have enough to get through this. Um, so with the Ten of Wands, you, you've got it. You've, you, you're now in the, the maintenance thing. So you made the final push. It's out there. It's working. You're now feeling the weight of all that experience. But it's not a bad weight. You know what I mean? It's, it's the weight of having gone through. It's, it's the lessons. It's everything you learned along with the process. It's everything you gained and everything you lost. And you're just sort of carrying that on your shoulders because we do in life. We accumulate experience and to me that's what the ten of wands is really about and i i am i have to fight the imagery on a lot of cards for that reason although it did come out of the weight smith um it doesn't matter what's on the picture of the card though because i feel very strongly about this because i've experienced it there's also an element here too of sometimes getting what you want doesn't feel like what you thought it would feel you know so you thought winning that award or getting that uh, commission or getting that job or or whatever was going to feel so good but the reality is that it's still work it's still work you know it, and the work's got to be done you know and you've still got to go through it and you've still got to carry it and you've still got to put the energy in because you know that's what we do um so you're just going to keep going you're going to carry it and that's why i like this one because it does it's a natural part of this being you know and this these points of light um you know even in the wild unknown it, you're going into the woods you know, but you, you're still, you're, you're just, you, you just go on and you've got all this experience behind you to get you through it. Um, so in the 10 of wands, you get that it's like a labor of love, you know, it's the true weight of our vocation. It's the pushing through to the finish line. 
it's continuing on um and 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 not just in spite of the heavy load but because of it um and then conversely in the negative tones you get dropping the ball or giving up throwing in the towel forfeiting breaking under pressure so you get that with the 10. Um, the core cards for me are always very similar in terms of the progression. So I do read them as a progression of energy. Um, and so with the Page of Wands, I think, you know, you, you sort of here have an art student maybe, or an intern, someone who's a neophyte at something but is really passionate or interested about it. Someone who is young but discovering their calling, uh, discovering an interest. This might be a protege if you're further along in your career. So this could represent someone you're mentoring or someone who's um, look who looks up to you. Um, it could also be just a, a burst of creative energy. Again, if this were partnered with the ace, this is probably the beginning of a project. Um, it could be beginner's luck, which I think is interesting. Um, and then, you know, in its negative form, the page could be a dilettante or Eve Harrington, you know, all about Eve. Um, someone who wants to be great without doing the work. Someone who has potential but refuses to practice. Uh, someone who refuses to engage, someone who can't pay attention, um, squandered potential. With the knight, you have a fiery, fiery guy here, you know, and when I say guy, I mean that really non-gender. I'm sorry, with the queen. No, with the knight, I'm right, sorry. Um, the knight is a hunter, as I always say, um, and he's a practitioner. He's probably someone who's early in his career, but he's out there in the world. Um, he may be looking for a vocation, so he may be like that person who's constantly like, what's the thing I really belong doing? Um, someone in search of new forms or new fields, someone who's like, I wanna find new styles. I wanna be like, uh, you know, revolutionize this field. Um, Someone in search of a vision or a community or a space. Uh, someone who's out there looking for opportunity. Someone who's out there in the trenches. You know what I mean? Someone who's sort of a missionary in a way. Um, a volunteer. I think the knights are frequently like grad student types. Um, and the Knight of Wands is definitely an experimenter. But then on the other side, you get someone who's lazy again. Um, someone who could but doesn't. You get sort of a partier. Someone who's lacking direction or ambition, someone who's lacking vision or a plan, someone who's waiting for opportunity to come to them rather than going and hunting for it. Um, someone who doesn't want to pay their dues in order to get where they want to go, or someone who expects to be given what they should be hunting for. You know, I'm going to come into this job and I'm, you, you better make me CEO after three weeks in my entry level position. Sorry, I just want to move through this quickly so my battery doesn't die, but we'll see. We'll see if we get there. The Queen of Wands is definitely um, sort of a, I, I think of like a doyen or a docent. You know what I mean? The the um, Meryl Streep or the Maria Callas or the um, Annie Leibovitz of their, of their world. You know what I mean? Um, uh someone who's definitely a champion for younger um, people in that field. So it could be an agent or an instructor, um, a prima donna in the best way, um, a star, you know what I mean? There's a star quality of the Queen of Wands I think is important. Margot Channing, you know, uh, she's been through it and she's done it and she knows it. Um, she's tough as nails and she, she, but she's not unwilling to engage with younger people in their field. Um, but then converse to that, you get a dilettante you know, um, or who made it by faking it, or a diva in a bad way, you know, um, someone at, you know, they're duplicitous, someone who's all talk, um, or someone who cuts themselves down to make others feel better. So you get that with the queen of wands. And finally, with the king, um, again, the king and the queen are very similar. The thing about the queen, too, is she's, she's like, I, and I didn't focus on this enough, but she will nurture the talent of others in her best um, and then with the king, you have a similar quality there. You have the embodiment of a, a craft or a skill. You know what I mean? This is someone who is the quintessential at whatever it is you want to do. Um, uh, Shakespeare, you know what I mean? Chekhov, um, Van Gogh, uh, you know, the, the masters, the Hemingways, the, you know, the, um, 
gosh, you know, I'm trying to think of a CEO I actually respect. <laughs> it's terrible, right? Um, uh, I can't off the top of my head, but Barack Obama, you know what I mean? The, those people who you really are like, yes, you, you know what you're doing, you've got it, and you've really been through it. Um, the embodiment of, um, of someone like that, a mentor, a guru, a genius, someone that you really want to study with, um, you know, someone who's the person who, like, is the, the real deal, the genuine article. They're the best at what they do. Um, but they're, you know, they're hard to come by, but you know them when they, when you see them. Um, and then negatively, you may get someone who's, and also ran, or who wasted their potential. Um, someone who's who's embittered, who didn't get where they want to go, and they blame others. Salieri, you know, in the movie Amadeus. Um, or a jealous teacher, you know, who misleads students to keep them from surpassing his greatness. So there's a duplicitousness there, too. So that's the King of Wands. Uh, again, really quickly. So my battery's going to die, um, so I am going to stop this now. But as always, I hope this is helpful. Let me know what you think. Let me know if um, I can elaborate on anything or help in any way and have a great have a great week and happy thanksgiving if i don't make another video before then if you're in the u.s be good